Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Unreal Fest. Um, a special thanks to everyone here in the room. I know you had a party last night, so uh, thank you for coming here early in the morning. We promise we're not going to make things too heavy for you this morning. We have a practical session about uh, how you can power your games with our free backend services uh, with a product called Epic Online Services. All right. Intro, Josh. Yep, yep. Sorry, my name is Josh Markowitz. <laughs> Uh, lead engineer with Epic Online Services. I've been with Epic for about 15 years. I helped with dedicated servers for Gears of War, uh, got a lot of the online infrastructure set up for Fortnite, and now we're trying to bring that out to all our external partners uh, that want to use the SDK. And my name is Rajan. I work as a technical account manager at Epic, uh, so I help studios and publishers uh, all over the world with uh, integrating Epic Online Services into their games and bringing their games to the Epic Game Store. So what are we going to cover today? I'm going to give you an overview of what Epic Online Services is and um, kind of what our current focus areas are, what our roadmap is. And then I'll jump into how you can actually get started using Epic Online Services with our developer portal. Yep. Then Josh is going to take over. Yeah, I'll be working with the uh, overview of the SDK. I'll talk about some of the fundamentals and basics that kind of founded the principles of why we wanted to do things the way we do. And then we'll get into a few examples, and then we'll talk about the online subsystem uh, plugins in the engine. Cool. So Epic Online Services um, is a set of backend services, like I mentioned. It's free for everyone to use. And we categorize these into two main areas. One is called game services, which are uh, universal services that you can use anywhere. You can deploy it anywhere. You can use any of our supported identity providers. Um, I'll show you a bunch of those in a little bit later. Um, and they cover services in these areas, right? So multiplayer, progression, moderation, and operations. And then on the other hand, we have Epic Account Services, which uses our Epic Games account system um, to provide you functionality across social, and it has an in-game overlay um, for players to interact with those social features. Now here's a slide breaking down that a little bit more. Here's all the services that we offer. I'm not going to go into detail of each one of these, but um, know that any of these things are kind of a la carte, so you can pick whatever you need in your game for whatever platform you're deploying on. Um, and you can only use those, you only have to use those services. They are pretty independent of one another. Um, the other thing to uh, remember here is that these are kind of distinct areas, right? So you don't need to use Epic Accounts or Epic Account Services to use any of those game services. You can use any other uh, identity system, your own, Xbox Live, Steam, Facebook, whatever, um, to kind of get access to those for players. And then the last thing to remember is that there's also a third component kind of in here that the Epic Online Services SDK covers, which is APIs to interact with the Epic Game Store. Um, we're not going to go into detail today, but um, if you're interested, we obviously have documentation on that as well. So the question we get a lot when we first start talking about Epic Online Services is, hey, why is Epic doing this and why for free, which is a, probably the more important question. Um, and the answer is pretty straightforward, right? So we built these services uh, kind of for, for Fortnite to begin kind of the online backend for Fortnite. Um, and these services kind of were kind of born from that. And now we're running those at scale. We're running them in our own games. We're running them for the Epic Games Store. And we figured we want to make these services available to kind of grow this, this notion of cross-play and cross-progression and online backends in the industry um, so it's accessible for everyone to use. Um, this kind of enables players, obviously, to interact with their friends and to play online. Communities are growing, and in turn, the entire industry will kind of get uplifted by it if everyone kind of creates this uh, inclusive, in, uh, inclusive game infrastructure, basically. But the, probably the most important piece is that we love seeing creative experiences from any game studios, so we want to help you to focus on making those unique experiences and not writing the back-end code to kind of support those things. So I just mentioned a bunch of things in terms of cross-play and cross-progression. Uh, one important area that we see today is you know, players want to be able to play everywhere and how they want, where they want. So there's a lot of terms that come into play with that cross-save, uh, cross-platform. Um, but it really boils down to players wanting to be able to pick up their game on any of their devices. They want to be able to access any of their progression across these devices and play with all of their friends. Um, which poses a real challenge for game developers uh, in general, right? Because this is the landscape that we're dealing with today, which includes every platform having kind of their own social ecosystem in there. They have their own set of APIs. So for players, that means that they're siloed from their friends if they're not on the same platform. 
But then for a game, it means you have to build different versions, implementing different APIs for each one of these platforms. So taking the example of you know Alice, she buys your game on Xbox, and she's excited about the game. She's friends with Bob, and she wants to play with it, but play with him. But uh, Bob has purchased a game on PlayStation, so you know there's no real interaction there by default. How do you solve that problem? It's not an easy problem to solve. So taking a look at that challenge, we can set out to achieve four goals in this space. Um, one is to provide a centralized cross-store friends list. So Bob and Alice can find each other on, uh, in, a, in a social overlay or of some sort or a friends list in general. Um, they can become friends, they can invite each other, et cetera, et cetera. Then the second point is, you know, they don't want, we don't want people to have like this upfront experience of like, oh, to do this, you will have to, you know, fill out 14 different forms to create an account and like all these things that, you know, we all enjoy very much in life. So Alice and Bob need to be able to quickly establish that account connection and then go from there. So we have this notion called proxy accounts and Josh is gonna go into a little bit more detail about what that is. Um, but that basically just eases the, the entry point for Bob and Alice to create accounts. And then once they, have, once they are in that social experience, we wanna make sure that it's a secure one where no one can really interact with their experience in a, in a malicious way. So we wanted to limit the ways that, for example, you can add and delete friends. Bob and Alice are always in control of that experience, right? So I can't just go in as a, as a developer, maybe by accident, like deleting their own entire friends list. Um, that's always a thing that they're in control of. And then obviously the important piece for you all as well is that it is plug and, plug and play for you, because again, we don't want you to focus a lot on integrating these services and spend a lot of time there. We wanna make sure that we provide that for you as a service, um, so you can focus on other things. Now here's a quick view of our current, kind of a, this is a snapshot obviously of our current roadmap, so you can see here are the things that we have delivered and services already, it kind of maps to the slide earlier. Um, there's a couple things that we are actively improving, like the social system where you know, we're um, obviously making things better there to make that even more seamless, integrating those things across different areas. Um, and then we're also adding new features, obviously. So in the social ecosystem, parties and chat are one of the things that we're looking at offering. But if you take a look at one of the more recent kind of things that's growing in the industry is that every game has its own ecosystem of, you know, items and currency and all those things. And you want to be able to securely securely um, store that inventory for each player. So we have a secure inventory service in the works that allows you to kind of manage all that so you don't have to create that own backup service yourself. Um, there's a URL here and a QR code if you wanna jump to our roadmap that's always gonna provide you with the latest information about what we have to offer and what we're working on next. All right, so getting started with Epic Online Services, you're going to need three things. Um, one is an Epic Games account. Um, then you're gonna have to do some configuration in the developer portal, and then you're gonna need the Epic Online Services SDK, obviously, to integrate into your game. So what are Epic Games accounts? Hopefully everyone knows, hopefully everyone has one, but if you don't, uh, it is our single identity system that we use across all Epic Games products, right? So Epic Online Services uses it, the Epic Games Store uses it, players actually use this to log into games, Fortnite, et cetera, um, third-party games as well, if they use, these, if they use this system. Um, and Developers use it obviously to gain access to the developer portal. So it's pretty easy, you need the one account and you can kind of go across all these different areas. Um, we have over half a billion players today with this account system, so it's also a great opportunity if you want to create a social experience in your game, but you don't want to build up that whole social ecosystem from scratch, right? Like you don't wanna ask people to, to re-add all their friends in your ecosystem again if they've already done that in a different system. So you can leverage that in your game as well. Now the developer portal, we're gonna dive a little bit more into kind of the, the actual experience of the developer portal next, but I wanted to take you through kind of the hierarchy of this, because me working with a bunch of these game studios, this is a question that we get often, is like, hey, how does this all kind of relate to each other? So it all starts out with an organization, which kind of represents the studio or the publisher inside of Dev Portal. So you create an organization, and then within an organization, you can create one or more products, and the product are basically, it's, it's a representation of your game or your games um, in there. Each product has access to one or more sandboxes, and these are kind of scoped environments for you to make configuration, right? So you can separate out your dev and your stage and your live environments. And then each one of these sandboxes, you can configure one or more deployments, and a deployment is really a way for you to kind of isolate player data. 
So if you want to you know, have in your test environment your unlocking achievements and you're doing a bunch of things, you don't want that to carry over to your live game, um, you would use a different deployment. And all of the, the data that is stored as part of the game services that we offer is kind of uh, scoped to that specific deployment. Then we have clients. So clients are basically where you define like, hey, this is the thing I'm going to connect from the SDK or from my backend to Epic Online Services, and with clients come client policies. And within these client policies, you define the capabilities of that client. So you can determine if I can you know, the, create a lobby or I can unlock an achievement, all these things. So typically we see that there are separate clients for the game itself and for the server, because obviously the game, you should inherently just assume that it's not trusted and not a trusted environment. Uh, and maybe you don't want players to unlock achievements maliciously by kind of spoofing the calls, et cetera. So, there's a separation there that you can do. And then lastly, we have the Epic Account Services side where uh, you have an application, which is called, and then that kind of controls the access that you request from players. So if I want access to their friends list, if I want access to you know, their country information, th those are things that you can specify. And then the brand settings is basically how that presents itself to the user. So you, with your icon, your website, and those type of things. So that, that's a whole lot of terminology and I don't expect you to remember all of this at once. So let's take a look at that kind of in context with the developer portal to see what that experience looks like. So this is the uh, organization creation screen, right? So once you first go into dev portal or you create a new organization, this is a choice that you have to make. Um, where uh, the main thing you have to remember between these choices is that if you pick the top choice, you will have uh, everyone who is a member of that organization, so every user that you add to that organization, they will be responsible for signing the EULAs and the developer agreements as they access different functionality in the portal. The bottom one, um, you'd kind of delegate that functionality to a single person, so your legal representative or some owner um, within that organization. Otherwise, it's pretty, pretty similar. You can always upgrade, upgrade from the top one to the bottom one later if that's uh, something that you um, require. So once you sign in to your, um, to your organization, this is the developer portal you're presented with. On the left side, you get some options to you know, manage your organization. You can view some of the accounts uh, for the players of your game and kind of uh, do maintenance on there and manage that. You can download the SDK, obviously, and then you have your list of products. So you can create new products or you have a list on the right side of the different products that you've created. If you create a product, it's very straightforward. You provide a name. You provide that background image as optional thing. That's just for the developer portal, by the way, so you don't see that anywhere represented outside of the developer portal, but it's an easy way for you to recognize, you know, if you have a list of 15 games, maybe, um, it's easier to, to click into the one you're, you're looking for. So once you click into that product, the left menu changes to all the different sections that you can use to configure all the different areas, right? So for the Epic Game Store, but obviously for, for game services and Epic Account services as well, there's some analytics there that we provide, so you can dig into those as well. And then there's a product settings um, the, uh, option at the bottom. If you click into the product seg settings option, the first thing you'll see is kind of the credentials that you'll be using for the SDK. So these are the IDs that you would pass within your SDK if you connect to the Epic Online Services backend. Um, you see that some of the stuff here is populated, some of it isn't, so we'll walk through kind of that experience as well. The second tab that you'll see is the sandboxes that I just mentioned, right? So here you can kind of manage those sandboxes and deployments. By default, you will have access to the live sandbox, which is the main thing that's kind of live, obviously. Um, you, the, the dev and the stage sandboxes will be disabled until you access functionality within developer portal that requires that. So if you publish to the Epic Games Store, for example, those will come be available for you. Uh, but you can always click on deployments and then manage your deployments within a specific sandbox to create multiple environments. You can create these things as public or as private, kind of depends on what you need and how you want people to access this deployment and the data that's contained within. So moving on to the next tab, identity providers. This is where you set up the, uh, surprise, surprise, identity providers to connect to these different sandboxes. So let's say you want someone on Xbox to be able to use their Xbox Live ID to uh, connect to these game services. This is where you could configure that. So uh, if you click on the Add Identity Provider, you see a list of all the identity providers we support today. Um, there's also Open ID at the bottom, so if you have your own identity provider, you can definitely bring that in here as well. Um, but so you can configure all of these, and once you do, you can associate that with a sandbox, and then from then on, someone can connect directly using their Xbox Live ID, for example. 
In the Clients tab, um, you'll see this screen sometimes. I just mentioned there's EULAs that you need to sign, obviously, like any service. Um, this is what you'll see when one of those things is required to be signed. Um, in this case, you know, if I sign it, you will see a notice up top, like, hey, if you want to also um, uh, access the anti-cheat functionality, there's a separate EULA for that, right, because it has its own uh, user agreement. But once you've signed all those things, you can add clients in here. So you can, when you add a client, the first thing you'll do is obviously give it a name, and then you can assign a client policy to this. And so the client policy is really where you define, hey, these are the features and the actions within those features that this client has access to. So again, my earlier example, if I want my game client to be able to you know, retrieve my achievement definitions to display them in the game, but I don't want them to unlock the achievements in the game, this is what you'll configure, and then um, if an unlock call is made or spoofed, um, it will, you will actually get an error back from the SDK saying, hey, you're not permitted to do that, you need to change your client permissions in here. And you can change these on the fly, obviously, depending on what you need. So once you do that, you'll get an overview here. You can even limit by IP address which who has access to, can connect to this client, et cetera, and then that client will populate in here in the overview. You can edit this at any time, like I said. The last tab that you'll see here is called Player Groups. Player Groups is a feature where you can provide access to uh, an extended group of people to private deployments and private sandboxes that you may not want to add into the developer portal. So by default, only members of the developer portal can access private sandboxes and private deployments. With player groups, let's say you have a QA department that is maybe a vendor that you hire for QA specifically, you can give them access to your game to log in and test the game without giving them access to the dev portal where they could you know, potentially make configuration changes and those things as well. So that's what you use player groups for. Now you have Epic, Epic uh, Account Services, moving on to that. Um, in here you will see the application. By default there's an application created for you. You will see the brand settings and the permissions and the linked clients that I talked about. Uh, the brand settings, you can configure obviously the name, an icon, a website, a privacy policy, URL. Um, then you submit that to us um, and we'll review that everything is okay and we'll approve it. And from that moment on, people can actually authenticate with your game without being members of the developer portal uh, again. So you'll see that notice up top uh, until you kind of uh, verify your brand settings with us. And then on the permissions tab, like I said, there's different scopes that you can request from users. So by default, you get access to their basic profile. But if you want access to their friends list, uh, this is something that you can enable. And then on the left side is the representation that users get when you do this consent request. So they can see like, hey, this game will access my friends list or it will access my online presence, et cetera. And then the last tab, pretty straightforward, you link the client that we just created to this application. So when I connect with this client, it knows that this actual consent is uh, applicable and that that needs to be shown to the user to provide consent. So once we've all done all that, going back to the product settings, this is all, this is all now populated. So you have a client ID, a client secret, um, which you'll use in the SDK as, um, to connect to these services. And then the last step, obviously, is downloading the SDK itself. So um, there's a different options for the SDK. There are different types that we offer. By default, you will have access to the C, the C Sharp, the iOS, and the Android SDK. Um, if you have access to console platform um, SDKs from Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, there's a process for you to let us know, and then you will get access to our equivalent SDKs as well. Um, so that'll pop up in this type dropdown. Um, and then you'll select a version. We offer the latest three versions, the releases that we have, um, including the patch releases for each one of those. So once you've all got that all set up, you're all configured in the dev portal, you can actually start using the SDK. So Josh is gonna take you through that experience. Okay. All right, well thanks Rajan. Um, yeah, let's start talking about some of the goals of the SDK, um, the fundamentals that we've uh, kind of established for you and the kind of the means that we had for accomplishing them. So the primary goal of the SDK is, as Rajan mentioned, is to let you focus on the game. We wanna focus on um, common workflows that uh, make our, your jobs easier, uh, like authentication and account creation. We'll handle that. We wanna provide support for social features via the common overlay and its interfaces. Uh, for games that are on the store, we offer a purchasing overlay uh, so that you can handle in-game uh, transactions. Again, we'll deal with the credit cards, we'll handle uh, that stuff and you don't have to bother you with that. We also wanna address, tr uh, address trust and safety issues that make sense for us to do so. We, um, on native platforms, we will look at the block list, we'll look at the user permissions, and where it's appropriate, we'll handle those things uh, to the best of our ability, as well as uh, tech sanitization, for example. 
Um, we also want to handle common patterns uh, for errors and resiliency. So for example, we'll deal with the auth tokens. As uh, they go to expire, we'll try to recover from that. So things you just don't have to worry about. Notifications from the backend services will route to you as appropriate, and we'll deal with uh, network retries and things like that when there's issues with the connectivity. Um, we also want to deal with integration with first parties like Xbox or Steam just to reduce your coding effort. And that's kind of in its infancy. We're working on doing more and more, but we also want to be aware that there are more advanced options and you may want to take control of some of those things. But we also want to, of course, make it easy to fit into your tool chain. So we've worked on making it plugin friendly. We're going to talk about the uh, Unreal Engine's online subsystem in a little bit. Um, but as well, there's, um, we've already noticed there's a lot of marketplace plugins that seem to be exist. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, you guys can take advantage of them as well. So the SDK was initially developed um, using Unreal Engine 4. We wanted to get up and running really quickly. But we also wanted to take advantage of the man years of time that we've spent you know, on our core libraries, our containers, the memory allocators, things like that. It allows us to share our platform updates and engine fixes with the rest of the company. We benefit from them. They benefit from us uh, as well. And uh, so the C interface, we were in the early days of the store. We had a lot of partners that just weren't using Unreal Engine. So we wanted to make a choice at early that would give folks um, the opportunity to use this SDK without worrying about Unreal Engine integration. Of course, this is Unreal Fest, so hopefully you guys are all on Unreal Engine, and, uh, but it works there too. Um, and of course, a part of our C choice gave us a stable application binary interface. Uh, at least with my experience, I know having to make requests of developers, can you recompile this this way? Can you recompile it in Visual Studio 2017, 2018, or, or 2022 now? Um, so working with C made this a lot more stable for us. So hopefully there's a lot less back and forth uh, with you guys as we, uh, as we develop new iterations of the SDK. So let's talk about some of the patterns that you'll see. Uh, we have this in the documentation. We want to kind of make it easy, you guys, to understand why we do what we do. Um, so if you look at the headers, we created a consistent naming convention uh, that segments APIs into namespaces and should make it pretty clear uh, where you're working and, and why. Um, we find a lot of common naming patterns such as uh, create and copy. Should be clear that we're doing something with memory there. Comes with a subsequent uh, release function with the expectation that you need to free that memory uh, when you're done with it. We also have, uh, we try to differentiate between queries and gets. Queries are asynchronous calls that will go out to the back end. They always have a callback uh, when they're done. They have error codes about what happened. And we also allow you to provide a context pointer such that when the callback does come back, you know, whatever context you were working in, you can retrieve that uh, easily. On the other hand, we have get. Get is more like a cache thing. You, you won't be going out to the back end. We obviously want people to use the cache data more than calling query. But just again, just make sure it's kind of clear um, what the differences are. Um, Everything works with opaque handles where appropriate. So typically each interface has an opaque handle. Um, there are some major objects that again, rather than having you get individual pieces of, of something, we give you a whole handle and then you can hold on to that for as long as you want to access this individual pieces um, as necessary. So more fundamentals here, data marshaling. Obviously C is not C++, so we tried to simplify or at least minimize the kind of work we do with marshaling data back and forth with the SDK. Um, so first off, we want to copy all the input that we ever get from you so there's no confusion about the lifetime of data that you're sending to us. Subsequently, when we give data back to you, we kind of expect you to copy it in most cases, if not all cases, just to kind of be clear that, you know, who owns the memory and trying to get, you know, get you back into your own safety net of, of memory management uh, as you go. Um, all strings we treat as UTF-8. So again, just so there's no confusion, we expect things in and we pass things out as UTF-8. Um, to help with some of the more complex containers, we try to provide helpful functions like uh, get counts that'll tell you how big an array is, um, get, key, uh, get by key name for, for like maps and things of that nature, as well as get by index functions so that you, know, you can iterate on the containers. We don't typically pass back, we're not trying to pass back tmap or tarray or you know, really large um, complex containers in that way. Um, at the same time, we tried to put a lot of effort into uh, batching. I know from my experience working with other SDKs, it was always unclear like whether you had to manage it yourself or whether you, you know, if you were in a for loop, whether I was exceeding the limits of, of the SDK. So with batching, we try to make it so that you don't have to care about that. Like if we have limits on the back end, we'll subdivide your data and call the code um, independently so that that, that works uh, appropriately. 
Um, we also want to make sure, like, we'll do some things temporally such that you could call something a lot in a for loop and we'll, we won't trigger off like 20 different calls to the back end. We'll try to batch that up ourselves, send that back to you uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, onto error handling. So we expose our logging via registered callback. Uh, you're free to do with that what we want. We don't try to like be invasive. We don't log to disk. We don't take up memory uh, with things like this. We just pass this stuff back to you. So you're free to do things as you want. Um, also, we have log verbosity similar to uh, UE4 and UE5. You can set and uh, change that verbosity as you need uh, when you're debugging things or when you ship. Um, we also try to do a really good job with input validation. We have tons of unit tests to make sure like all the crazy ways you guys might accidentally call a function, we don't crash or we at least try to provide helpful information to you about how this might work. Um, and then of course we try to, we have quite an exhaustive list of error codes uh, to try to make it very clear what's going on so that they don't all map to you know, invalid call or, or something that's just not helpful uh, to anyone. Um, finally, something I added, I hope that it gets some value. It's, it's kind of debatable at the moment, but we kind of call back our async calls. Like when we're retrying or when we're working through throttling issues or back-end connectivity issues, we do let you know so that ideally you can provide a UX experience to the, develop, uh, to the player that um, you know, we're having trouble connecting to a service or it's gonna be a little bit longer. Uh, so I hope people can make use of that uh, feature as well. So now that we've kind of covered the, the basics here, I just wanted to talk about um, the one of these biggest sources of things is like the key ring here is that uh, we have two services as Rajan mentioned we have the game services and we have account services but one of the biggest mandates we had was to break them up and to make it so that you just don't have to use epic accounts if you don't want to you're free to use any of the services we have and just take the pieces that you want and connect them right up to an auth provider that maybe you're more comfortable with or you already have integrated uh, with your game so we abstracted away these things we created something called the product user ID, which is, it's not an identifier, other than an identifier, it's nothing else. It doesn't hold a user's display name, it doesn't deal with uh, email addresses and passwords and stuff like that. It's just simply something that the user is associated with. So we wanted to make sure that you could take, you know, Steam, Xbox, PlayStation, or any other kind of uh, provider there, set up a product user ID and get right into lobbies, voice achievements, et cetera, without having to worry about how our stuff works or using your Fortnite account. Um, if so, uh, so choose. Um, so the key ring you know, works like this, and um, it's just a level of indirection. You can swap these out, and, um, and then uh, it won't really affect the user as long as there's one key on the key ring uh, at any time. So let's see here. So let's talk about uh, logging in. So this is a slightly modified version of what we have in our documentation online, but I just wanted to kind of show it here. Um, you start with a login function, you take an external auth token, and you pass it into our functions. If it's successful, it means maybe the player's played before, you know, okay, good, you're done. But what really I think people need to pay attention to in the early days is, is that initial experience. If they don't log in successfully, well, the question you have to ask yourself is, or, and get the user to understand is, have they played this game on another platform? One of the biggest issues we have is account merging. Folks making an account or, or not even realizing they have an account on Xbox, they go to play on Steam or PlayStation, they accidentally make a new account and they wonder where their progress is. So this kind of step is super important. If they haven't played, or if they haven't played on this platform before, we wanna make it very clear to them, do you have another account? And of course, if they do, if you're not using Epic Account Services, there's slightly a little bit of complexity here working with, you know, getting a sec, how do you log into a secondary auth provider such that you can then take the, the secondary auth that you've logged in with, take this new auth token that you had from before, combine them through link account, and then complete this step. So link account is, is the same as adding a key to the key ring, um, but in this case, if you don't use Epic Account Services, we have the functions, but the, the work is kind of on you to log in with these other things to get these credentials. If they don't have an account, if it's a first time user new to your game uh, completely, it's a little bit easier. You just call our create user function, it creates the platform user ID, and you're done. So that's kind of the Epic Account Services side of things. The other side is the Epic, or sorry, Epic Online Service side of things. This is the Epic Account Service side of things. Um, we want people to be able to access our user identity, as Rajan mentioned before. It gets you access to the social graph. It gets you access to their user presence. Um, and you're gonna have to implement this side if you want to be able to access that. The key ring's similar. Again, we expose Steam, Xbox, PlayStation. Um, typically, users have been pretty well set up in our, you know, the 500, uh, half a billion uh, users that we have. Um, but the good news here is that you can leverage the account portal to 
get the users logged in from this side. If you choose to go this route, you'd want to take this token and pass it back in the login code we just saw previously. The idea being that you have one key on that key ring and many keys on this key ring. We try not to mix the two because it kind of it, it's really um, it can cause uh, accounts to kind of get orphaned and things like that. So you really want to kind of either choose this or choose that. Um, and but they do work together, as I as I was trying to say. So. Let's see here, we're gonna talk about um, the login flow here is almost exactly the same. Uh, sorry, I guess I got ahead of myself. We take the external auth token, we pass it in. We work through the account portal flows. They'll kind of, this is a, an example of one of the intro screens. It just kind of lets the user know what external account they're gonna be logging in with, what, what the Epic account is gonna be. They have an option to sign in and go through that flow, or they can create an account. Now creating an account here in this case is creating a proxy account. The idea is that it's a way for the user to skip account creation, but we still keep track of the users themselves. So that like, if they're skeptical or they're not sure, they can still earn progress and we can still have a place to attach their friendships that they're growing from a recent players list maybe. And when they see the value of the account, they can say, oh, I'd like to promote this to a full account. They go to epicgames.com, they give an email address and password, and they go. Otherwise, you, know, you do the sign-in flow, they log in with their Xbox account or their PlayStation account via the web. And, and they can log in uh, right there. So um, I guess I kind of talked about proxy accounts there, uh, the account portal flows. There's the dev auth tool. Dev auth tool is, um, it basically emulates um, some of these flows for developers. You can sign in via web page on your PC. Once you've done that, it keeps track of things and the SDK will talk to that to give it auth tokens and sign in as if you were launching from the launcher. So you don't have to have the launcher running while you're developing. Um, okay. See here. So let's talk about some scenarios with multiplayer and social interaction and voice chat. You know, going back to Bob and Alice, you know, they are on two different ecosystems. How do we get them playing together? What does it really mean to be cross-play, cross-progression, cross-social? So we'll start off with multiplayer. We do have two APIs in the SDK. One's called sessions, the other's called lobbies. What's the difference? Ultimately, they're not that different. They have different reasons for existing. For example, let's talk about some of the things in the middle that, um, that make them in common. Well, they have find and search capabilities. You can you know, obviously look for which, if you know, pistol's only true or time of day equals night, you can find the, either a session or a lobby that has those attributes uh, that you're looking for. Um, random players are joining. I, I kind of put that there just to separate from the idea of parties, which is a different uh, thing. These are the fundamental things that games would use and you have you know, a 10 player game, random players, maybe they'll become your friends someday. Um, the associated data between them, we mentioned the key value pairs for finding and searching. You're free to set whatever you want. And then your traditional stuff like game invites. You can either programmatically send invites or use the overlay. Uh, join via presence, um, the idea that you can click on a friend, see that they're online, they're, they're actively inviting or passively inviting you to play a game. You can join them without their explicit um, permission and just show up. Uh, some of the differences for lobbies. Um, it's clients only. This was a way to kind of get around, um, or one of the side benefits is you can get around um, NATs, uh, strong NATs and strict um, firewalls and things like that. We host the lobby so players can join there and it doesn't matter. Like who, you don't have to worry about the NAT when it comes time to, to join a thing. It provides a persistent connection, which gives you benefits of like data updates. So anytime I change the data, um, everyone in the lobby will know that the data has changed. It also has a way for um, you to hook data per member. So in addition to saying pistol's only true, you could say that Josh is you know, a level six knight or something like that and you know, it just, it's just extra ways to kind of set, uh, store the data and, and manage the data. Um, and then uh, it has voice chat, which we're gonna get to in a little bit. You can optionally turn that on. Sessions is more traditional, um, like master server, uh, register yourself with something, get a, list, you know, uh, get a list of search results and join. So that's typically you know, in the dedicated server space. Dedicated servers don't have a persistent connection, so they, um, they kind of just make calls to the back end and let them know as, as things change when people use that for search results and to join. I uh, wanted to mention, uh, once, uh, once mentioned peer-to-peer, -peer. so once a user finds a game, they need to be able to join it, of course, right? You're free to use your own network connection code. Obviously, Unreal Engine has um, a pretty powerful set with the net driver and the UNet connection. Um, but one big thing it doesn't have is a way to kind of do the signaling between players in a peer-to-peer -peer game to, so we have the peer-to-peer -peer API. Um, it's basically a handle connection negotiation. It can hide IP addresses um, from the players, and if necessary, it can use a relay service to kind of get past those, fire, those tricky firewalls so that 
players can still play with each other regardless of um, their configuration. Um, of course, it, as mentioned in a talk yesterday, it does have some latency uh, associated with it. Okay, so let's talk about the life cycle of a game session. This is kind of maps, I tried to map this a lot to the way uh, Unreal Engine does its thing. So you start by creating a modification handle. This is where you can pass all your initial data, key value pairs uh, of how the session, the playlist, et cetera, is gonna go. You call update session, and now the, the host is sitting idle. Um, players find that session, which we'll get to in the next set of slides, um, and they start to log in. You register the players with the session. Uh, after a certain number of time, the, the appropriate number of players are there. Uh, the gameplay starts, you call start session, that's important because if you don't support join in progress, you want to allow the back end an understanding that this search result should be thrown away and no longer uh, given to players while the game is in session. So as the game plays, game state changes, you're free to update the data as you will in a join in progress, maybe you're adding and removing number of players or map cycling changes the map name, things like that, you keep this up to date and uh, things happen. Eventually, you know, if it's join in progress, players are logging out all the time, coming and going. Um, maybe the match ends, people log out, so you unregister the player. Um, and finally, gameplay ends, you call end session. That you don't have, end session does not mean destroy session. It just basically puts it back into an idle state such that if people are searching, they can find the search result again. Um, and if you say map cycle or you have other rounds to play, you can go back to the top and start again. Otherwise, you call destroy session and kind of return to the main menu or, or kick the players out and start all over again. So that kind of talks about how a game session works, um, and you're really just pairing the data that you have in Unreal with the bookkeeping that you need in the lobby or the session uh, data there. So moving on to session search, this thing's going on. How do people join it? Well, they call create set search handle. It gives you access to, again, a set of key value pairs that you can set. You can do um, one of three search methods. You can kind of set the parameters, like I'm looking for a pistols only equals true game or playlist ID equals seven game. Uh, you're also free to set player ID if I'm looking for a specific person. Now this won't let you find just anybody. You know, we don't, we don't want to use that as a kind of a, a negative toxic way to, to find and disrupt people's games. But there are use cases, it's documented how this works um, and what, what scenarios you can do. You can also search for session IDs specifically, like if you say your game crashed and you launched again, you want to be able to find the session you were just previously playing in, you can do that too. So you call find sessions and you get a set of search results. Once you have your search results, you, again, you're kind of free to iterate through them. You, know, you can see how many you have. You can look at the data. Maybe you want to do some client-side sorting, right? Um, for what's the, you get 20 search results. Which are the best ones for you? Maybe you, you can do um, search criteria like nearest. So you know, find me a game where the account level is nearest 20. You, so that's like the absolute value, like 19 and 21. Maybe there's an 18. But you, the, you're free to kind of search the results um, and figure it out yourself. Once you've found one that you think is OK to join, you ask the back end. Um, and if it's not already full or if it's, uh, if it's still alive, you'll get you know, a success message. You take the search details from that um, and you can use, well, either an IP address to join the dedicated server, say, or a socket handle, which is in the peer-to-peer -peer interface, um, and just make a request to join Josh, right? And it will, it'll connect and, and do the work there. So we had Bob and Alice. They were friends uh, in real life. And now we have a common matchmaking pool. In theory, they were able to find each other and play a game together, but they're still not you know, doing much as friends. So how do they leverage that friendship, right? Well, that's through the social overlay. As we mentioned before, this does require um, making use of Epic account services. But if you do, you get this overlay for free. To be, uh, just to kind of be clear, if you don't want to use the overlay, most if not all the functionality does exist in the APIs for you to run and create your own UX. Some things like friend management, we do want to control more critically just because, again, we don't want people accidentally deleting friends lists. So um, you work with, you can work with the overlay. You have a list of your friends, people who are online, offline. You can hit invite and send them invites. You can search for friends. The little, um, the badge up there at the top is like you can look at um, achievements and see what you've unlocked. There's a settings screen, uh, so on and so forth. So you kind of have a lot, wealth of information, the user presence, what game are they playing. Uh, you can send them invites, as I mentioned. We handle all the trust and safety, so we respect block lists, as I said. People that maybe are on your Xbox block list won't show up in this list. People that um, maybe if you try to s send invites but your parents have set 
um, user permissions to you can't play multiplayer games, these buttons won't work, or they'll tell you that, you know, go get permission to, to get those things done. So as it makes sense, we try to handle trust and safety. Well, like I said, we also run text sanitization through any user-generated content that you can see on the screen so that um, we can make sure that uh, cross-play uh, gamer tags are appropriate for the platform that you're on. Okay, so now Bob and Alice are in a game playing together. They have a friendship that they can leverage through the social overlay. Well, how can they communicate with, um, with each other while they're playing? So we offer voice chat in two forms. It's the same thing, it's just whether or not you wanna bring your own set of trusted servers to the situation and you kind of wanna go off on your own, it's a more advanced uh, method. You can use our web APIs or maybe you're running a dedicated server and you wanna you know, control rooms for teams or something like that. Or you can take use of the a much simpler path and integrate with lobbies. Simply by um, setting a value, you can, um, you can say we'd like to have voice chat with, uh, with the lobbies. But regardless of the method, the voice APIs are actually pretty robust. You can do things like setting your input, output. Um, you can get access to the raw data streams if you want to do post-processing. Maybe you want to try to convert it to positional audio, um, things like that. So there's a lot of callbacks and things you can do with the voice code um, once you're connected. So let's talk a little bit about these two flows. Um, in the case of lobbies, I said we host the trust. So basically the big thing on the right there, the lobbies understand player management. It knows the number of lobby members that are allowed. It knows when um, you're full or not full. So ultimately when you join the lobby successfully, the lobby code on the back end will talk to the voice service. It'll get you an auth token to, co to communicate with the media service. And then once you've successfully joined the lobby, you join the media service and then the SDK handles all the work of trying to keep the connection and uh, keep you uh, both in the lobby and in the voice um, chat at the same time. Uh, as we mentioned, or as Raja mentioned briefly, the client policies, like you do have to kind of set this up so that you can uh, tell us that you do want this feature uh, to work uh, that way. With bring your own, the, the box kind of changes and it becomes your responsibility, whether you, if you're using a dedicated server or a game server of some kind or some other trusted source, the lobby membership or the player membership is your responsibility and at the end of the day when the game client talks to the service, uh, your service, you would be responsible for knowing whether it's okay to kind of talk to the voice service. We have an, our APIs, you would get the auth token yourself, pass it back to the client, then of course the client would connect as usual on your terms, not as part of lobby join. Um, and again, there's a client policy that um, needs to be set uh, for that. So now that we've kind of explored the basic capabilities of the SDK, Bob and Alice, they're voice chatting, they're matchmaking, they're sending invites to each other. Hopefully they're happy. How does this kind of fit into uh, the Unreal Engine? Okay, so we have a plugin that we created at Epic. We use it for our own games. Um, we've had, a, I've, as I mentioned before, we've seen a, quite a few good third party options. Um, I haven't really looked into them uh, too deeply, but when I went to their web pages, they seem to have good documentation and something we don't have, which is really good blueprint support. We are gonna work on that, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, our OSS plugins kind of come in two pieces. One we call OSS EOS, which is, as you'd expect, it is a wrapper around the SDK. It implements all the major features um, that we've just been discussing and more. Um, and it also has one called EOS Plus. Now that one's, it's not really temporary, it's meant to be used, but the idea here is it wants to go beyond, it, it merges two OSSs together, the one, the EOS one, and then the native platform. So what you really want to do is um, it'll like get the Xbox token for you and log you into the game and, um, and then things like it will keep an eye on sessions and lobbies and maybe do the native sessions and lobbies code to, to, so you can see things in presence on the Xbox dashboard. Um, so we're gonna try to take more responsibility of that and put it into the SDK and we do have a flag that we're working on managed by SDK versus managed by application. So we'll be looking look for that um, in the coming months as we, as we uh, create the SDK uh, further and do more things. We also have a Lyra, oh, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, yeah, next slide, sorry, I was looking at the wrong slide, apologies. Okay, so um, some things to keep in mind when working with the plugins, you know, it does ship with the engine, but you're free to kind of look into GitHub and Perforce um, to kind of stay up to date with the changes we make. OSS typically doesn't have a lot of dependencies on the rest of the engine, so you can kind of get out of sync and, and not really impact yourself too much. Uh, Rajan showed you guys in the dev portal, you can bring your configuration values into the editor uh, and save them there. It does bring you back to C++ from C, so you know that it's more convenient for most to work in C++. So I just mentioned the GitHub parts, and then 
we're just trying to do more of the heavy lifting um, and make sure that uh, you, know, you guys have to can focus on your game. Uh, it's demonstrated in Lyra. Uh, there is a web page and a QR code there on a whole tutorial on how we've integrated the SDK with Lyra. So I think that's a great jumping off point if you're interested in how the code works, get the code samples, and go from there. So this is a little bit just kind of the roadmap we have here of the future. With 5.0, we were, we're introducing online subsystem version two. So right now we're kind of working out what um, proof of concepts, prototyping it, see how it works, uh, where, where it's gonna go. Uh, UE 5.1, we implemented the OSV2 in the context of EOS. We added a null interface, if you're familiar with OSS already, um, and an adapter that lets OSS v1 code work with OSS v2. Um, so similarly, this online services plugin, which is the new name here, we will be implementing it in two flavors, one with as a game services, and then extending it with EAS to add auth and friends. So again, if you don't want to use both, you don't have to. And of course, we're thinking about blueprints. We understand and we've heard loud and clear that it would be really nice to have better blueprint support. Uh, so we're working on how to, should it be one-to-one -one with the rest of the SDK? Ideally, we'd like it to be like a matchmaking node that handles a lot of the code under the hood, try, is, tries to be friendly and follows out the right callbacks as, um, as uh, things progress through the platform. All right, so I think that's about it. I'm gonna turn it back over to Raj in here. Yeah, thanks. So just to wrap up here, to go over kind of what we covered, obviously Epic Online Services, free backend services that you can use to, use, uh, to power any functionality in your game. You can use as much or as little of it as you want. Um, you can deploy it on any platform, use any identity provider. Um, we also showed you how to get started in the developer portal, getting the SDK itself, and then um, using the Unreal Engine OSS plugin. Um, everything that we talked about today, you can go to this URL, dev.epicgames.com slash services. Uh, you'll find our documentation there. You'll find access to the SDK, the developer portal, and everything that we talked about. Um, and with that, I want to thank you again for coming here this morning, everyone here and online. Um, thanks for coming to our talk.
there's a lot of big challenges in making a video game. There always have been, and they've changed over the years, but the issue these days is scale. Being able to produce the amount of content that you require.
the acquisition. And the reason we want to kind of highlight some of these things is because maybe you guys aren't aware of some of the things that the Quixel team has been doing kind of behind the scenes as far as integration back into the Epic Games ecosystem. So we want to kind of highlight some of those things today. And then we'll talk kind of about like the current state of things and where we currently are uh, with some products. And then we'll move into a future roadmap discussion of some of the trips that we have lined up, some of the various tech that's coming online, and a bunch of different things. So uh, yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started here. So I think the first place that I want to start is that uh, we really have kind of redefined our mission statement here. So. Um, the mission statement here says, to enable creators, brands, and players to easily make high quality content by simplifying world creation. And ultimately, that's at the core of really every decision that we make here at the company. Um, you know, so that means not only giving access to high quality scanned content, obviously, but making it so that we're educating people in, in how they can actually become uh, really adept at, at scanning on their own. So uh, we'll get into a lot of the different pieces of that statement as we kind of go along, but I think this is a really great place to start as it kind of sets the table for a lot of the things that we're going to be doing uh, in, this, uh, in this conversation. So I think the first place to really kind of start just as far as notable highlights and the things that we've done over the last couple of years is that the Quixel team's been very involved uh, on special projects, so I wanted to start here. Um, so it kind of depends on the demo as far as like our overall level of engagement here, but some of the things that we've been doing specifically here, uh, just showing Lumen in the land of Nanite here. So this was actually right around the time that Quixel was acquired. And so this was very much a trial by fire uh, for the team to be able to go in and actually kind of integrate with everything that was happening in Epic. And I can say just having uh, you know, worked on it pretty closely that it was like drinking from a fire hose, uh, going in and just kind of learning all the different ways in which uh, the team uh, was kind of building out these amazing uh, demos and everything, so we learned a lot through that process. Then moving on to kind of Valley of the Ancient, this was, I think, uh, probably a bigger integration as far as uh, the Quixel team was concerned. So, uh, you know, we actually sent a really small crew uh, to go and scan in Moab, and we got a huge amount of content that was actually able to go in and, and kind of power this demo. So uh, this was definitely, I would say, the biggest team lift as far as, you know, kind of mobilizing all corners of the company in order to actually realize a full demo uh, for a really, really new version of the engine, obviously. So lots of uh, important uh, kind of learnings uh, along this whole process, but we really, really uh, love the end result. And I think that ultimately, you know, when we kind of talk about these demos, you know, we, we really love the, the, the product, obviously, the end result of everything that we're doing, but ultimately we squash a lot of bugs in the process and we make you know, the engine so much better through the process. So uh, with the Matrix demo, uh, we had a kind of a smaller footprint, I would say, on this. You know, we did several scans uh, for the project, um, world building, general support where we could. Uh, this was obviously a really important demo, you know, just in kind of showcasing open world, uh, you know, for the engine. And so the Quixel team was involved uh, wherever it kind of made sense on this project. Uh, and so it was definitely a really, really fun venture um, and just one of the biggest worlds that we've ever created kind of working inside the engine. So, we also kind of work a little bit on the VF ICVFX side. So with ICVFX, you know, we, we work very closely with the team uh, at our El Segundo office. You know, we have uh, a volume of our own where we're actually doing a lot of demos, internal testing, making it so that we can actually bring a really, uh, really fleshed out product, uh, you know, for ICVFX users, right? And, you know, for us, you know, with this, it's again kind of sourcing high quality content that goes into these demos. Um, and also just kind of, again, making the engine better, right? Whenever we're kind of doing these new demos and we're talking about things that we want our users to be engaged with, this is something that, you know, these demos really kind of help uh, further that process, right? So not only pushing us as far as, you know, the quality of content that goes into these types of demos, but also, you know, for us, you know, getting really tight deadlines and turnarounds, you know, in order to kind of make these things a reality. So, and like I said, you know, we love all the end results of these demos, but really for us, you know, at the end of the day, like, <laughs> it's so cool to see the engine gets so much better through the process. All right, so let's start with the, I think the twin motion integration is, is a really kind of notable highlight here for us. This is something that happened pretty early on as far as the acquisition was concerned. And uh, this was an integration that we did really early on to be able to bring twin motion users access to Megascan's content. And I want to highlight this because I think that this very much set the table for a lot of the things that we did 
as far as bringing Bridge directly into the engine later on. So that integration uh, was really, really important for us to kind of get our first our first kind of handle on what it looks like to make Megascan's products actually integrated with a new piece of software. And obviously, Twin Motion is an incredibly amazing piece of software. Um, and the quality of work that comes out of everything that we're seeing for Twin Motion in the community there is super impressive. Um, you know, after we were able to pull off the integration and make it so that Megascan's content was available for Twin Motion users, we ultimately hope that uh, everyone felt that the quality of content and everything around the ecosystem just ultimately improved. Um, and so it's really pretty cool to see just uh, what creators can do when they have such a much larger palette to play with uh, as far as content is concerned. I think another really important highlight here is actually the acquisition of Capturing Reality. And I hope if you guys have had a chance uh, to go over and meet some of those guys over at the booth, um, these are some of the coolest people that I've met here at this company. <laughs> they're, they're so awesome. And it's just really, really cool to see all the advancements that they're making as far as technology around this, this solution. So the reason I think this is worth highlighting here is because we were very vocal you know, at the, after we were acquired by Epic uh, to make it so that we could bring the Capture and Reality folks into the fold. Uh, this was something that was really, really important to us because Capture and Reality is ultimately at the, the core of really everything that we're doing as far as processing scans. Uh, so this was something that you know, for us is really mutually beneficial in that we're a good partner for them and that we can actually tell them exactly how we're scanning stuff. They're obviously, in, they're obviously talking to a lot of different users around capturing reality, but for us, you know, it's really, really cool to have that direct line of communication and we can help influence the roadmap around a lot of things that are kind of happening here. So reality scan, like I mentioned, is really just a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, but I think like the, the cool thing for us is again, just being able to learn from the team more than anything even just in the last couple of days of just being here at Unreal Fest, it's been pretty amazing just to kind of share knowledge uh, with that team. And I've been sitting in on some of their talks and some of the various things that are happening around capturing reality, and it's just an amazing ecosystem to be a part of. Um, so if you guys haven't had a chance, I would highly recommend go and chat with those guys. Uh, they're here for, I think, I think they're here for the rest of the day. Um, so yeah, definitely go and chat with them. Another really important piece, you know, as far as highlights that we can touch on is, is obviously MetaHuman Creator, right? And MetaHuman Creator is something that, you know, for us, having Bridge be a part of that process was really pretty cool, right? So you're, you're obviously kind of doing your own scans, uh, you know, either in a sunflower or using reality scan or what have you in order to actually kind of create these, these uh, kind of baselines, right? And then bringing them back into MetaHuman Creator uh, or Mesh MetaHuman or what have you, and then kind of using Bridge as the hub and the conduit back for that information. Uh, so I, I really wanted to highlight this as well because again, it's kind of similar to you know, the, what, we're, what we're just talking about with capturing reality in that the three lateral team is obviously incredibly adept at scanning. <laughs> they're, they're amazing in what they do. Um, and so it's been really, really pretty cool to be able to have a really tight level of integration with that team. And again, just share knowledge and hopefully make the products better at the end of the day. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about trees. So, this is something that, so I've been at the company for almost five years, and I can say for sure that this is by far and away the most requested asset type as far as anything that goes uh, into the, the list of requests that people kind of approach us with. Trees are incredibly complicated, obviously. Uh, the, the, I think that the tree team will probably tell you they think it's probably the most difficult thing to make in 3D. Um, and obviously making it run uh, in real time is something that's again just an incredibly difficult challenge. So with trees, this was something that we specifically built out a proprietary uh, pipeline in order to actually create uh, a really, really amazing next generation look at trees. Um, so we're really, really uh, very proud of the end result here. We've only released uh, two packs. Uh, if you guys have been over to the, to, the, uh, to the booth today or over the last couple days, you may have seen the new pack and we'll show some of those renders here today. Um, but, uh, but we're really excited about this product. It's something that we're continuing to put resources in we very much want to have the industry leading uh, kind of approach to vegetation in real time, specifically in the engine. And so if you guys have downloaded the trees, you know that there's just a ton of controls that you can actually manipulate here and to actually get the end result that you're looking for. Um, so definitely give those a look if you guys haven't already. Um, and like I mentioned, we'll show some renders of kind of the new tree pack later on here in the presentation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Bridge. So Bridge, in case you guys just stumbled into the room and you don't know exactly what Bridge is, Bridge is kind of our main hub uh, specifically for Megascans content. 
right? So this is where if you're opening the engine and you want to have access to Megascans content, this is where all that information really lives and you can just literally drag and drop directly into the viewport. It's really just an amazing uh, piece of the puzzle as it relates to content creation inside the engine. So I think it's worth highlighting here that since the acquisition, or start, sorry, since the uh, launch of UE5, we've had over 21 million assets that have been downloaded inside of UE5. That is a mind-blowing number. I can speak for the entire team that we were just blown away at the reception for this. Um, and so it's really pretty cool just to see the meteoric rise that the product has had and just so many people engaging with the content. So like I said, you know, with Bridge kind of being just a, another window into the engine, this has definitely lowered the barrier for entry for artists. And we're really pretty thrilled to see how people are engaging with the technology. And I think it's pretty cool too in that, you know, we have students that are working with this, this same technology that's being used in major motion pictures and AAA games. And so it's really kind of like making the quality of the industry just rise altogether, just having access to that quality content. So again, just amazing, amazing uh, to see those numbers. We're blown away by the response, truly. And then uh, it's also worth highlighting that since the acquisition, we've been putting a lot of resources, obviously, into uh, kind of creating a huge amount of content for the library. And what's cool about this number here, so just over 6,000 assets, uh, since the acquisition at the end of 2019. Keep in mind that a lot of this is actually through COVID as well, so definitely some challenges as far as traveling and getting the content that we were really kind of looking for. But the team has adapted really well, and it's pretty amazing to see. And now, you know, just as of the other day, we were sitting over 17,000 assets currently in the library. So um, that number's gonna continue to go up, and we're gonna continue to put amazing content in for you guys. And if you guys were in Lewis's presentation the other day, you probably saw some of these, these different cells here. So um, I'll just kind of quickly talk about it. But uh, this is Reality Scan. If you guys haven't seen it or had a chance to take a look at it, what it is is just a, a really amazing phone app to be able to uh, allow creators to do their own scans via a phone. Um, so we're in a closed beta right now, but we're definitely going to be increasing the number of people who can actually have access to the tool um, going into next year. But if you guys haven't, had a chance to mess around with it, I would definitely encourage you guys to go over to the booth and give it a shot. It's really pretty cool. Um, this is something that we announced a couple, a couple months ago, but just an amazing reception so far. It really kind of makes it so simple for people to jump in. If you've ever felt intimidated about doing any type of photogrammetry, this is something that's a really great entry point. And just to kind of illustrate that point of what it can do, it's definitely not just for hobbyists. So uh, this is a, a really small example of a scene that one of our lead artists made. Um, of a trip that was actually based in Sweden. And most of the content here was actually gathered on that trip. There's a couple assets that were from the Megascans library, but most of everything you're seeing in this scene was actually captured with a phone, which is pretty amazing. The assets stand really, really well alongside Megascans assets. So the quality is phenomenal, right? Like we're getting nanite quality meshes that are just really pretty impressive and create visually rich worlds inside of UE5. Um, and the process is just so simple. So I uh, wanted to showcase this because it's just a really cool example of what you can do with the tool. All right, so our YouTube channel. This is something that, uh, again, we've been putting a lot of resources into, you know, just for the entire duration of the, the, the lifespan of the company. Um, and just since, you know, the acquisition, we've had over 29 million views on the channel, which is, again, just a staggering number for us. And we've, we've grown our subscriber base to over 358,000 users. If you guys haven't had a chance to check out some of our content on that channel, you're looking to get into environment art or creation, anything around photogrammetry, would highly recommend you go take a look over there. We really aim to make high quality content specifically for our users. And if you guys have any ideas or requests about the types of content that you would like to see go up, we'd very much like to have that conversation. So, come grab us at the booth, or we're gonna do a Q&A afterwards, so anything you guys have for that, we'd love to hear it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the future and some of the various trips that are gonna be happening uh, over the next uh, 12 months plus. So uh, I figured I'd show just a couple images of some of the, uh, the scan trips that have either already happened, or these are some just basic scouting pictures from various places around the world. Um, so you can see our team just in a bunch of different locations here um, and learning some of the capturing reality guys here in this shot here. So you can see, um, you know, again, just that sharing of knowledge has been really, really pretty cool. Um, getting some really nice uh, kind of historic pieces here 
This is actually that, the, the trip uh, from Sweden that you guys saw from the scene that I showed you of our lead artist making that scene with a reality scan. Um, so you can see just how cool <laughs> this location is, very coastal, very unique shapes, pretty awesome. Again, some more coastal stuff. Um, and then we have a huge presence actually in Pakistan, and so we have a team you know, that's constantly going and scouting various locations around, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful place to see. There's so much uh, richness and detail there as well, so we've definitely been doing a lot of scouting. Uh, some really pretty cool stuff here, just some uh, amazing looking vegetation. <laughs> These are definitely off the wall and crazy, but it's definitely something that we think fits pretty well in the library. And then the temperate conifer forest, so specifically the Sierra Nevadas, this is a trip that I actually got to go on. Lewis was on that trip as well, if you went to his talk. Um, and you know, we, we spent a lot of time out in the Sierra Nevadas. This is just an incredible place to be, um, and we're definitely looking to get a really comprehensive breakdown of this, this ecoregion, right? So that's not only just what you're seeing here, some of these amazing kind of rock formations and large boulders and things like that, but trees and all the different kind of uh, flora and fauna that kind of make up this whole area is pretty amazing. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go and visit, I would highly recommend it. Um, so definitely a lot of stuff there. We've also been working on more tropical environments here. So you can see these are some, uh, some scans from, uh, or these are some pictures of the scan trip specifically around a very tropical environment in the broadleaf forest and the coastline. Uh, so definitely a lot more of these types of scans to come online. It's really pretty cool to see all the integration of like the roots and everything that we're doing there. This is a pretty cool shot of the team scanning at night. Really, uh, if you guys have ever done any amount of photogrammetry outside, you will know that <laughs> there are so many factors that go into making good scans. And uh, you know, we have limited time out in the field for a lot of things that we're doing. And so sometimes we are literally resorting to scanning at night, <laughs> which is, it presents its own set of challenges, but um, it's pretty cool to see. And broadleaf forest, this is a, an entire ecoregion that we're really kind of looking to spend a huge amount of time and resources in as far as uh, kind of bringing that content directly uh, to our users. So this is a pretty cool slide, a bunch of, a bunch of various things here from uh, pieces in Europe, um, but uh, caves are definitely a big focus for us here. You can see um, we're definitely kind of exploring different ways of scanning here as well, so not only just kind of using our flash scanners and pieces there, but um, by the way, if you guys haven't seen our flash scanners, we have them at the booth, so you guys can go check them out uh, in person. We're also doing a lot more of kind of like man-made elements here, as you can see in this slide. Right, so the man-made assets have gotten a huge reception uh, just as far as we look at all the metadata, obviously, for the way that people are actually uh, kind of engaging with the content. And so man-made stuff is definitely something that we've been putting a lot of resources into. Um, so some industrial stuff here, as you can see as well. So the thing that's pretty cool about this is that obviously we're able to go like these kind of cool scrap yards and places where we can kind of get assets where you don't really know what the brands are. So the reason for that specifically is because we don't do uh, anything that has any copyright information, anything that could be kind of traced back. So this is something that we kind of intentionally seek out as far as you know, cars that are intentionally destroyed and various pieces of scrap that we can kind of get our hands on. I figured I'd show just some behind the scenes shots here of the team in the field. Um, this is what it kind of looks like for us like at, a, at an Airbnb. Uh, so you can see all the different kind of Pelican cases lined up with the team scanners. And then we daisy chain a bunch of batteries together at the end of the day, and I'm sure that the Airbnb hosts love their electric bill when, uh, when they come back. But uh, that's what we gotta do. So we go into the field totally prepared, make sure we have enough uh, equipment and time in the field to be able to get everything that we need. Um, and this is from this year, Nevada's trip specifically. So just to quickly recap, these are some of the various places that you guys can come to expect uh, over the next you know, year plus, uh, we're really very excited about a lot of the content that's coming down the pipe here. All right, so some of you guys maybe have seen the announcement that we put out on our YouTube channel the other day, or maybe have even walked over the booth to see some of the new uh, kind of tree scans, but I figured I'd show some of the, uh, the latest stills from the, uh, the, the hornbeam uh, kind of forest here. This is something that uh, the team has spent a lot of time on as far as kind of getting uh, amazing quality trees and vegetation kind of working uh, all with this uh, kind of broadleaf example here. So what's pretty cool about this is, again, like we work really closely with rendering engineers here at Epic. And so for us, it's you know, not only making the content, but obviously moving the ball down the field as far as making it so that we're making this content in a way that can be digestible for the engine, right? So with that, 
you know, kind of working very closely on what does it look like to realize trees that can be fully nanite and actually work well with lumen and don't, you know, completely wreck performance, right? So these are problems that we're actively looking to solve. These are stills in the engine, actually. Um, and if you guys want to see a live demo of these trees, like I said, you can go over to the booth, check it out. Uh, our uh, lead vegetation artist, or one of our vegetation artists, Nils, is over at the booth, and he can give you guys a full breakdown of everything that we've done uh, with these new trees. All right, so assembly. So mega assemblies were something that we announced uh, during early access. If you guys saw the Valley of the Ancient project, this was something that uh, we announced at that time, and then we kind of like stealth released a couple packs on the marketplace, um, and then we haven't really talked about it. So I figured it's worth doing a quick recap of some of the things that are happening with mega assemblies. So they haven't gone away. Uh, this is something that we've actually been putting a lot of resources into, and we, we really wanted uh, to get a huge amount of content kind of set up and then release it all at once. But I wanted to give you guys a look at some of the things that have kind of been happening around mega assemblies. So if you don't know what it is, basically this is actually a very curated approach to creating uh, mega scans assets and, and have like kind of a little vignette of all the different pieces working together, right? So if you were to look at any of these pieces just on the mega scans library, you probably have, you know, like that stump right there would be its own asset, the rock would be its own asset the vegetation and the ground clutter, all that stuff would be its own asset. We're actually releasing these as full pieces that you can use, right? So you don't have to assemble these things on your own, right? And this allows us for creation to become so much faster as an environment artist. Um, so we're really, really excited about mega assemblies. Uh, we're doing a lot of work to make it so that these things are performant, make it so that they're smarter, so we have lots of plans down the road as far as uh, kind of making them a really, a truly next-gen offering. So there's a lot of really cool stuff here, and we're working in various eco-regions here too. So this is a really pretty cool uh, Nordic coastline set. Uh, the team's been working really hard on these. These are just stunning pieces uh, on their own, but to see them kind of assembled and curated in this fashion is pretty awesome. Uh, we have a lot of stuff from Moab, obviously, that we got from Valley of the Ancient, and so we're gonna be releasing even more of these going forward, just a truly unique <laughs> kind of set. Um, and there's so many cool examples of how people are using the Moab set just on its own, um, and all these kind of like alien examples and different planets and stuff like that. Iceland continues to dominate. It's just a, a really awesome set of assets for us, and so uh, sometimes we're actually going into our backlog of assets that we haven't processed, bringing some of those new assets online and kind of working them into the mega assembly workflow. Um, but again, just we're able to cover so much more ground with this, right? Um, and so we're really kind of maximizing what we have as far as what's already in the library and some of the things that we wanted to go back and actually reprocess in the background. Again, this is another Iceland one. Um, so yeah, lots of really cool stuff happening there. Uh, so stay tuned. We haven't put that to bed. It's definitely something, excuse me, that we're, uh, that we're looking to continue to uh, elevate and bring to the community. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about fabric. So <laughs> if you guys have ever downloaded any fabric from the Megascans library, You'll probably, you probably will have noticed that the quality is really not up to snuff, especially if you're downloading that next to maybe something, a surface or a 3D asset uh, that's maybe more recent. So we haven't really done any fabric uh, in a long time in the library, but we've actually completely done an overhaul of everything that we're doing with fabric. We're doing a lot more scans. We're gonna have a ton of this stuff. Again, we're just kind of holding a lot of this content until we can release a huge amount of it all at once. Um, so you're gonna expect a significant increase as far as overall quality with everything that we're doing with Fabric. Um, and just know that it's just a completely new pipeline for us. So I figured I'd actually show the gear here as far as uh, how we actually go about uh, curating or getting that data. So uh, it's pretty involved <laughs> and it's gone through a lot of iteration to get to this point as far as how we actually gather this data. But I think the most exciting thing for us with this is that you know, if you go into the Megascans library right now, it's very much curated towards environment artists, right? And that's by design, right? But we really wanna make it so that we're not just talking to our users that are in that space, right? There's character artists, obviously. There's so many different ways you can do uh, simulations with uh, various fabrics, you know, in all different types of settings, be it games or film. Um, and so we really wanna make it so that we have a really robust offering as far as fabrics. Um, and so, you can definitely come to expect a lot more of this content. And again, we really hope that people like character artists will be able to go into the Megascans library and find value in a lot of things that are happening here. So uh, I figured I'd show 
just what that looks like, uh, because we're really pretty excited about it. All right, so the last thing that I want to show uh, before we move into the Q&A section here, and again, if you were in Lewis's talk the other day, um, you probably saw this, this trailer here, but we've been working on a really comprehensive uh, demo, or sorry, a, a, a documentary uh, that's really kind of going into all the various parts of scanning. This is a very comprehensive documentary. It does not focus on just one part of the process. We're talking about scouting, we're talking about gathering the data, processing, the hardware, everything. If we really get very much into the weeds, it's gonna be multi-hour, you know, in length. Like, it's gonna, it's, it's pretty awesome. We're very excited about it, and so I figured I'd roll a trailer so you guys could see it. There's a lot of big challenges in making a video game. There always have been, and they've changed over the years, but the, the issue these days is scale. Being able to produce the amount of content that you require for some of these big games is the ball game. The goal of Quixel is to scan the world, and our job is to break it down. So we have to scan the things that are the essentials to build the world. In the early days of experimenting with photogrammetry and scanning, some of the early scenes that we built just blew our minds. We were able to build some of the coolest looking scenes. You're really showing what's in real life and it looks good. It just works. Something that Megascans has done to help democratize the process is to scan huge numbers of locations. We have this amazing rock here, which is super iconic. That would be extremely good to capture, but obviously that would be a very, very tricky asset to scan. So we need to assess, is it possible or not? It looks doable. It really doesn't matter if you have just a simple phone or a really, really advanced camera. The better resolution, the better scan. But essentially, taking a picture is all that matters. The techniques that Quixel developed in terms of how they scout, plan, break down a shoot into the components, the way they photograph it is, is like super precise. This company is not just about making a bunch of photograms, it's about a discipline and a passion for making photoreal assets that are at the pinnacle of what you can do in a computer today. With Quixel, what we're able to do these days is to provide a library of some of this content of the standard that you may not even have the ability to make yourself inside your company. And having all of this stuff available is a game changer. This gives you a capability that you just simply have never had. It's an amazing resource. It's an incredible resource. For any future in the metaverse, it's probably going to revolve around content. And to fill that need and to hit that quality bar, we need to educate people on how we do it and how they can do it. That will be the perfect hybrid. And that is definitely how worlds are going to be created in the future. These tools are no longer just for the people who have kind of focused their entire career on this. Everyone is going to be able to do this. And as we start to see Quixel bringing these tools into the market and letting anybody use them any way, everyone is going to be able to play together to tell a better story. As we build out this foundational library and as we create the tools that allow just about anyone to build the worlds of their imagination, it's only then it becomes truly accessible to all of humanity. Well, like I said, we're incredibly excited about the documentary. We hope that if you guys are at all interested in photogrammetry, if you've ever thought about getting into the space, or maybe you're spooling up a team at your studio or just on your project around photogrammetry, this will be a huge resource, right? It's, it's going to be coupled with very technical documentation. It's really very comprehensive. So we can't wait to show it to you guys. Um, just, uh, yeah. So we've wrapped a little early here, but before we do that, before we move into the Q&A section, I just wanna say huge shout out to all the team members at Quixel. Um, you know, it's because of all the hard work of the people who are in the trenches um, that, that, are, that are doing really the hard work that allows me to be able to stand up on stage here and talk about all the amazing stuff that's happening in the company. So huge shout out to all my colleagues around the world at Quixel. Um, so yeah, that's all that I have today, but if you guys have questions, we have, uh, we have a mic over here, and we can take as much time you guys would like.
my mic on now. Hey everyone, um, thanks very much for coming. Well done for making it through. I know this is one of the final sessions of the event. Um, I'm afraid that I lured you into this room uh, with talk of ecosystems and the Lego group, and now I'm gonna hit you with a bit of discussion about compliance and regulation, but I try, will try my best to make it interesting and hopefully you can get something from it. Um, in all seriousness, today we're gonna, I'm gonna be walking through um, some areas we think are really important, um, uh, very important areas of the gaming landscape, of the digital landscape in general. Um, we view that collaboration um, and, and kind of interaction between uh, gaming companies and platforms is, is the only way to improve the ecosystem for players in some of these areas. So we're really passionate about building the right tools and, 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 and services um, to allow that to happen. And I will be highlighting how in particular we've got partners like the Lego Group that are kind of on this journey to improve the landscape with us. Um, who am I? Uh, my name's Paul Nunn. I'm Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Developer Relations at Super Awesome, an Epic Games company. So uh, we're part of the wider tool set that, that Epic offers out to developers. Um, our focus has always been since, since uh, 2013 when we were founded um, to help developers with the tools and services they require to manage youth audiences. So our part of the landscape is to think about mixed audience games or, or games in general where youth audiences are a part of, a part of the mix. Um, what makes youth audiences different? So why is there a set of tools required or a, set of, uh, a different set of uh, thoughts and thinking around these audiences? Well, mostly because of the legislation, because of the protections that these audiences are, are kind of covered by in terms of the regulators. So um, I've highlighted a couple of the main regulations there. You've obviously got the copper legislation and the, the GDPR uh, in Europe. Um, these are very common uh, legislations, cover, cover lots of different audiences, but in the case of copper, very much focused on youth audiences. These really necessitate compliant practice and, and they kind of mandate additional tools and services to to help uh, developers and, and platforms to manage them. And it's really an evolving landscape that is changing very, very rapidly. So, you know, I could have put, you know, 20 more flags on this screen of, of current legislation or impending legislation in discussion that is kind of really creating a very uh, swiftly moving landscape of, of things that, and considerations that developers need to think about. And so we're trying to aid developers by building tools to help with that kind of swirling complexity that goes on around legislation with audience management. Um, how, does it, how does this really impact developers? So what are the tools that we're producing for? Where, where, where does this show itself? So I think where you, where you get this, uh, this interaction is really in, in the tools and in the games and in the services. So if you're a developer, you're aiming to build the best uh, quality uh, game you can, delight your users, you're really focusing on um, how you can make the best experience for your players. And you're doing that via a number of different features and functionality, most commonly, you know, very, very common now to have lots of these features that are on the screen in your games from social and community features to chat functionality to account systems for persistent identity, geolocation services in the case of some mobile games. Um, lots of this stuff is very, very common. And when you're, when you're interacting or when you've got an audience who is a youth audience, depending on the market, that depends on the age that we're talking about here. But if you, in general, if you've got a youth audience member, you, there is certain ways that you need to think about that audience member as different to the rest of your users. And that's because of the legislation and where it interacts with uh, your uh, necessitate certain things because of the collection of data. So really these features and functionality allow, uh, require the collection of personal information, personally identifiable information, or they, um, are, they allow the sharing of that information by the user. And there's lots of other considerations around these user groups, but this is the primary area where the law is, is covering. And, and they require something called verifiable parental consent in a number of cases, or in a lot of cases. And this is, this is the area we're building tools because it's very difficult for a developer to tackle this stuff and to think about this complexity themselves. So our, our suite of tools, the stuff that, that we produce, kids web services as we term it, um, effectively there are, there are lots of things that we, we produce, but we produce two main modules that cover consent management and parent verification. They're the two pieces, if you like, of uh, delivering verifiable parental consent for a developer and therefore allowing them to have, you know, safely interact with, with a youth audience in their game or in their platform. Um, I thought it was worth covering off why we think this in, is important. Uh, I think is there's a number of reasons why we are focused on this area and why we see it as a real fundamental key to building a, a safer and a, a better landscape. The first one is, um, with the complexity surrounding the privacy legislation and, and, and really with the friction that the VPC process uh, introduces for the player, developers can often avoid uh, engaging with youth audiences, you know, increasingly under 16 year olds. And, and um, 
usually they're doing this because they, they don't want to act badly. They, they fear inappropriately collecting data. They don't want, how a lot of cases don't have the resources to kind of tackle these issues and understand what they're dealing with. Um, but this has several effects. So there are lots of knock-on effects if a developer decides to remove features for a youth audience member or they uh, in, entirely re restrict the service when they don't need to, of course. Some services aren't aimed at kids, but when they don't need to restrict that audience, um, there, are, there are lots of knock-on effects. First of all, the audience misses out, right? You, you, you miss out on lots of players coming into your game or your account system and using your service who probably would really be valuable users and would love it. And um, in the worst case, it can lead to the, to the, to the thing that we don't want, which is, which is users misrepresenting their age and then ending up in services with the, with the developer not understanding or knowing their true age in, in the systems that they're collecting data in. Um, the second reason is, is that they are valuable. You know, increasingly, the legislation is kind of broadening and interacting with more markets, and developers have to face that its, it's audience is under 16 and could even stretch to under 18s. You know, this is going to be uh, an issue that developers, a lot of developers, are going to want to take care of over because um, you don't want to miss out on valuable players. If you're building an account system, if you're thinking about you know, uh, the, the way that you interact across numerous titles, you really want as many users as you can in a lot of cases. And, and these users, if you talk about like a 15-year-old uh, in a lot of markets, they're really engaged. They're really good players. They're really good users. And by the way, they're building brand loyalty. They're building you know, an association to games, like I'm sure a lot of us did as well at that age. And so you kind of, you want to draw those audiences into your account system. Um, not many account systems want to be ignoring a big chunk of one of the fastest growing audiences on the internet. Um, and the last thing is uh, we, we provide these solutions because there is a growing need. I talked about the fact that there's a lot more legislation out there, but there are also a lot more games, a lot more of these features and functionality are woven in, you know, cross-play, um, social uh, interactivity in games. It's getting more and more and more prevalent, and we need to think, we, we think about that because there is a need for a global solution. All of our technology is translated in some 16 markets who have enormous products globally because there is going to be more and more a need for a solution to come in and remove some of the friction that players feel and that parents feel in this process and, and um, ensure that we cover off developers with the right set of tools. So I'll briefly cover off what, what these tools actually look like in practice. So these are the two core areas. Once again, we've got um, consent management and the parent verification. Consent management should be very easy for us to understand because I'm sure every one of us has interacted with this a great deal for ourselves. You know, uh, a, a service or a game has to provide um, evidence that you've given consent or you've given permission for them to collect your data. In the case of a youth audience, they are not, they are below the age of digital consent. They can't give that permission. So the parent has to come in and say, yeah, I'm fine uh, for, for you, uh, game developer, to collect my, my child's email address to create an account or to collect their data and, 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 and they're hap I'm happy for them to use your service. So um, we've mocked up a, a fictional game company here. It's a couple of screens that navigate through to the to the, to the parent to say, hey, are you okay with your, the data collection that's being requested here? This isn't really the problem. This is where you get more of a problem because this is where the law mandates in, in several markets. It's not good enough for you to just get, get consent. You then have to provide evidence through verification that the person giving you that consent is an adult. Because if you don't do that, then the, parent, then the child could set up their own consents, they could set up their own parent controls, they can kind of do uh, everything that they want on their, without their parent being involved whatsoever. So when you uh, get to the, the screens here with verification, what, what is required is the parent to engage with some kind of verification method and provide evidence that they're an adult. And this is really a problem. I've, I've put reduced flow here because there's obviously several more screens, at least three in that section there where the parent has to get through these screens to, to provide evidence via a verification method. And, and so really how I would describe the situation is should look a bit more like this. You know, consent management is understandably a module that's required and lots of services will provide it, but parent verification is kind of this prickly, frictionful, difficult piece of the landscape. And this is the, the core area where I think we can only get through this if we collaborate as, a, as an ecosystem. Um, so how do, how do we look to improve this situation? So we've just shown a lot of screens that the parent needs to get through, necessary screens for the legislation. Quite rightly, there's friction there because that provides a way for, for us to safely navigate with parents involved in their kids' digital, digital lives. But how do we improve the situation? Well, well, firstly, there's some basic stuff. So the first thing is 
you know, we need to communicate really well. So we spend a lot of time thinking about UI to speak to parents and, and lots of our partners do too, to, to educate them why this is necessary. You know, why are we asking for, the, for the, you know, their credit card details? Why are we asking for them to, to provide the last four digits of their social security number? It's because the law mandates that we do that and we protect their, the information that's gathered from their children. So in order, to, in order to improve the landscape, the first thing that we need to do also is to uh, give every parent um, the ability to make the verif verification choice they're most happy with. You know, we, through our Kids Web Services tools, we aggregate the best methods of verification that are compliant with the legislation that we possibly can. So we've got a number of different solutions. You know, we offer a face scan in, in lots of markets outside the US currently. Um, so the parent can just scan their face for, a, for a, an age estimation that will provide verification. We've obviously got stuff like payment card and social security number, last four digits of social security number, as I mentioned, identity card scan. So we aggregate these sources together. The idea here is that um, we don't make the choice for any of our partners. So a developer who uses our tools and software, they, um, you know, they configure these different verification options as they see fit, and they roll them out as they see fit. It's their, their decision here. But we aggregate the methods at the back end and provide them. Um, and the reason that this is important is because parents have a very different view uh, individually about what is the best way for them to verify. Some people will be totally fine with providing a credit card once they've read the details of why we're asking. Other people will be much, much happier with an identity card scan or a face scan. So we don't make that choice for the parent. We just offer them a set of solutions that they can choose. And we're always adding to these. So we really, you know, this is an ongoing kind of uh, project for us to aggregate as many verification methods as we can, keeping up to date with the legislators and working to help improve the choice available to parents and developers. Um, but the second piece is, is really what I wanted to focus on today. So the second, the second area that we can really improve the landscape is via a piece of technology that we call the parent graph. And this is really based on collaboration. And this is where we come uh, to our friends, the Lego group, because it's here that we're able to really give you an example of how um, this kind of collaboration between the two of us, and hopefully uh, in the future, many more uh, partners, along with the ones that we already have, is really gonna help. This is how we're gonna help the landscape. So uh, Lego, um, Lego group, I'm sure lots of you know them. Um, for 90 years, the Lego group has inspired generations of children through play. The company is a leader in defining safe digital play experiences for children. They have tons of experiences, tons of products and activities in this area. And um, the partnership that we have with the Lego group is really based on a mutual objective to improve the VPC process and to improve the experience for players and parents who interact with both of our, our services and games. So to give you an example and to show you how this works, um, this is the situation. So uh, when a, a, a player uh, under the age of digital consent creates an Epic account, they're required to have their parent or guardian go through VPC, as I've explained, to verify they're an adult. So we've got that friction, but we end up with the, the parent managing to pass verification. Um, the Lego group do this too. So they do this exact process. Here I've shown, again, a, a slightly reduced flow for a parent to uh, log in and provide consent and uh, verification within the uh, Lego Life app. And you see here that there's the same friction, there's exactly the same process, the law is the same, and, and they're going about it in a really good way. The communication is excellent to the parent here, and, and, but they're really looking to uh, enforce the regulation and be compliant with, with what's going on. So now we have a situation where the same parent has a child that uses both service, services potentially. And I would say there's, a, there's a, a good deal of children that are in that bucket and parents who are, who are faced with this. But, wouldn't it be fantastic if we were able to remove the fact that the parent has to do this multiple times, the verification step? Um, that's exactly what we do with the parent graph. So effectively, to be clear, the, the consent management piece is still per product and per service. Of course, the parent still needs to give permission for their, parent to, uh, for their child to use the different services in, individually. But we can at least remove the verification piece. So we can really smooth out the user journey for parents who, who, who interact here. And, it works both ways. So uh, wherever a parent first interacts with that verification process and provides the evidence they're an adult, that's the last time they, they have to do that in this ecosystem that we're creating. So we're basically shredding the amount of data collected from the parent by ensuring that the uh, parent only has to verify once. And that's what the parent graph is aiming to do. It only requires the parents to verify their adult status once. Um, and this is actually the key to why collaboration is, is truly required to improve the ecosystem, because we're only gonna collaborate, if we collaborate together, we can make this happen. Um, it's a tool, the parent graph is a tool that allows us to, to verify adult status once, and it is essentially an anonymous network of pre-verified parents. So um, 
how does it work? So if I run through a diagram very briefly about how the parent graph will actually uh, operate, we've built it completely transparently. Um, it's built for a very singular purpose. It doesn't do anything else for us. It doesn't have any other purpose other than the purpose that I've just discussed about smoothing out the user journey for parents. And it works like this. So if you are a new parent, uh, you've come into an ecosystem, our ecosystem because you've, you, we've got your email, we need to provide verification for the person attached to that email, then we create a one-way encrypted hash of your email address immediately. Um, we then check it against the parent graph database. If the, if the entry's there, then we'll go into that. But basically, what happens if you're not in the parent graph, if we haven't got that one-way encrypted hash code in our database, then we pass you through the standard verification methods that I've just outlined, and you provide evidence that you're an adult. Once you are successfully through the verification process, we store your hash along with several pieces of anonymous information, stuff like the method of verification that you chose, the country that you're in, the timestamp of when you did it, so we can allow people to move out of the parent graph after a certain period of time. Um, but that's all we store, it's completely anonymous. We can't you know, send you an email down the line, we don't have your email, we just have a one-way encrypted hash which we can utilize only for the purpose of taking a look to see if we've already got it. And that's exactly what we do. So you, the start of this process, we one-way encrypted hash the email address of the parent, if the parent is, if that hash is in our database, then we can entirely skip the process um, which is outlined on the previous screens. And, and that is um, an enormous amount of friction removed. So the best way in our view to, to improve the landscape is to just not show the screens, to not have the parent required to put their credit card details or their social security number in. And that's exactly what happens. So the parent in a situation where they've already verified before, using a service that uses our tools, they will just click verify I'm an adult and then they will receive a thank you very much for verifying and that's it. That's in between there'll be nothing else. There'll be an email sent to them which is part of the legislation but really their journey through this process is a lot easier. Um, and so why is this important though? Like we've just talked about uh, how ourselves and the Lego group are working on this. We've got many other partners. Another one there is, is shown on screen among us, a really high number of users playing a fantastic game there. Um, but really, this problem could be really, really huge and will be really, really huge. So I've talked about the fact the evolution of the landscape in terms of privacy uh, regulation is, is rumbling on and more and more developers, more and more games, more and more account systems. This will deluge users and players. It will keep a lot of users out of, of games. It will keep a lot of users out of account systems un unnecessarily. Uh, and it will create an enormous amount of friction in the process. So really, the, the solution is, is, is that we ha can have an enormous impact through this as we aggregate more and more services and we talk to more and more partners and, and more people kind of buy into this idea that something like the parent graph will be uh, a necessity to smooth out the friction that's here. Um, and the benefit that I'm talking about, the, the, the interesting piece of this is that um, we've um, talked a lot about the user journey. We've talked a lot about how parents uh, require this service, how um, it can, it really is a necessity to try and smooth out friction, but developers are the ones that benefit too. This is really an ecosystem benefit, we would say, uh, from the parent graph, because more, uh, more parents through VPC means more players in games. And this is, this is, this is what's happening right now. So KWS and our, the parent graph have been running for a number of years now. Um, there are currently 11 million parents, over 11 million parents in the parent graph right now, already pre-verified and gone through that verification process, which is a very large number. And it, even at this early stage, it has a dramatic impact. If a new product launches or a new game launches, we've seen partners have an increase of 20 to 30 percent on the conversion rate through the, the parent verification process because the parent graph is there to aid uh, and to remove some of the friction that's required from parents. Um, Really, um, in summary, I think it, we see the parent graph and, and collaboration on tools like the parent graph to benefit everyone in the ecosystem. It's gonna drastically reduce the amount of data that's collected in these processes that are required by law in, in many markets. You know, the, the benefit will be felt by players primarily and, and by, by their parents, but it will also be felt by, by the ecosystem in terms of developers and in terms of everyone. Um, and really, stuff like this, we would say, it's a very practical, you know, technology and collaboration tools like the parent graph we see as a, a step towards inclusiveness and, a, and, and kind of improved player experience that we feel would be kind of part of what is being described as the metaverse. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like, just like to say that uh, all of the tools that I've talked about, any developer or platform can use all of the tools that I've talked about 
uh, freely, you have access to the parent graph freely, we make it completely available via dev portals and everything else and by our direct team. Uh, and it's entirely free, so there's no commercial uh, element to this whatsoever. We don't charge anything for any of the, you, any of the tools that I've described here and many more, and we provide a lot of stuff like parent support and, and things like that down the road too. Thank you very much, everyone.